call the meeting to order. Heather, could you just roll call? Yes. Um, Todd Williams is not a, able to join us today. Scott Holwick? Here. Roger Lang? Here. Allison Gould? Here, but remote. Uh, Tom Duster? Here. Ken Hewson? Here. Nelson Tipton? Here. Wes Lowry? Here. Kevin Bowden is not here. Fancy Jaffe? Here. Uh, Jason Elkins? Here. David Bell will be joining us later. Heather McIntyre is here. And then it looks like we have some other staff members too. So, Becky Doyle and um, Raven Martin are both here as well. Councilmember Martin is not able to join us today. Okay, thank you. Let's start with the uh, approval of the previous month's minutes. I think everybody's had a chance to read them. Any comments? I'll move to approve, Mr. Chair. All right. I'll second, I'll second that. Okay, thanks, Paul. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, who's doing the water status report? Chair, I will, I will do it. Thank you. So uh, today the flow of the St. Brain Creek at Lions uh, Gate today at 25 CFS, the 124 year historic average for this date is approximately 24 CFS. The call on the St. Brain Creek is Pleasant Valley Reservoir. And the uh, admin number is 7822 with a priority date of 6-1-1871. The call on the main stem of the South Platte River is Riverside Canal, admin number 21,031, with a priority date of 8-1-19-07. So St. Frank Basin storage at the beginning of November is um, at 67%, with a five-year average uh, storage at this time of year is 7%, so we're real close to the average storage for the basin. So Wright Price Reservoir Buttonock Preserve is currently at 6,388.6 feet, which is equates to 13,786 acre feet. So we're down approximately 2,400 acre feet from full and currently releasing 30 CFS. And Union Reservoir is all but full and uh, we're releasing 7 CFS. That, that level down 2,000, is that pretty normal this time of year? It's it's a little lower, but it's pretty close. Uh, this time of year, we we as you guys all know, we Wes can chime in. But uh, September was in October fairly dry, um, so we uh, start some early out of there uh, a little earlier than, than average. But we're we're pretty close. Okay. Any questions for Nelson? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Item five, public invited to be heard. I see one public person to be heard. Uh, so I think your name's Gordon Pedro, is it not? Hi, I'm Gordon Pedro, 2639 Falcon Drive, one one. I'm here to speak on the cash and move policy review that uh, you have on your agenda. Uh, Wes was uh, good enough to make sure I got the information that I asked for, so I'm looking mostly at uh, his staff report. But um, 1964, the policy was uh, enacted by the city council, and so therefore it's been around for a long time. And everybody that's proposing to annex or develop are aware that they have water, groundwater requirements that they must meet. Recent trends in the report indicates that uh, since 2015 to 2020, more cash and loo has been utilized than uh, uh, submission of uh, raw water. Uh, and when I look at the uh, chart that was in your packet, from the uh, comparisons for the region, it seems to me like it's easy to see why the uh, uh, increase in cash and loo is going up. And that is, we're at 18528 uh, dollars per acre foot and the lowest next one is thirty six thousand that goes all the way to seventy five thousand per acre foot. So just looking at this and I understand from uh, Wes's uh, communication there are some nuances that uh, have to be considered. 
But one of the things that it looks to me like is that raw water is one of the options. Developers and annexators can go cash and loot if they so choose. It's their option. I think that the cash and loot should be reflecting the real cost of water. And if it's not, then we're subsidizing and discounting what we should be getting for our community uh, for water, the median rural water requirements. Recent councils have indicated they want more density in this community, which I don't have a problem with. But more density means we have more people who are going to have to deal with more water. And climate change is a big, big unknown. And as far as I'm concerned, our community deserves to have the water it needs in the future. And that comes from water. It doesn't come from mountains of cash. Now I know that the cash is used for various things and storage and all those type of things, so I'm not trying to discount that it's a complex issue. But I'm trying to say that this citizen believes that what we need to make sure is we have water. We have other options, the, the community, and the citizens have other options for getting money available to build storage facilities and those type of things. It's called bonding, and we all know how that works, and we all have a right to vote on this. But you're going to recommend in the city council a policy, uh, maybe a policy change, maybe not, but you're going to be recommending rates or, or cash and move amounts, and I think that they should reflect the true cost as well. But it, what any developer or person annexing knows he has to respond to, it's not that difficult. They've known since 1964 they were going to have to respond in such a way. If they bring in water, it costs such and such. If they're going to do cash and load, it should cost very similar to that same amount. And one of the things that I've noticed though, in the last 10 years is that just about every time the city council decides that they're going to uh, discount something or provide an incentive or a subsidy to a developer, it's about, oh, it's affordable housing. We've got to have affordable housing. Well, if you're going to use that as a reason for discounting your recommendation to the council about what the cash and should be, I would like to see how you see those translating into real affordable housing, not just some theoretical, well, it'll go and get passed on. My experience has been it gets passed on to the developer. It's a windfall for him, and it never gets transferred to the affordable housing. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Gordon. I don't see anybody else coming to my visitor, so we'll move on to item number six. Agenda revisions and submission of documents. So uh, you wanted to move the uh, item number 10 up to the top. That's correct, Ken. Yes, if we could move 10A, the remote attendance policy, up um, to the first item or up to this Next item, item so okay. that we could uh, you know, allow full participation for the rest of the meeting. Okay. And then also, um, staff would propose to move item 8A, which is the cash and the policy, to uh, item 9B. That that will allow us to have basically the rest of the meeting we think we can get through there through the agenda pretty quickly and that'll allow us we won't have to worry about getting to the remainder of the agenda and give us as much time as we need to talk to cash and move honestly i probably should have had it on nine anyway because we're not you know it's not we're not asking for a recommendation to council yet um and so um, probably shouldn't should have had in general business to begin with. So if we could move those to item 10A and 8A, we would appreciate it. Okay, and uh, 8A, you want that to follow item 8D? To, to 9D, the, the last item, the nine instance staff. Okay. 8A, which is cash and money. Okay, 9D. 9D. Very good. Okay. Um, Let's take on item 10A. Ken, I'll let you uh, take that on. Sure, thank you very much. Um, so we have in front of you, um, as you may, Water Board may recall last month, we looked at the um, Water Board bylaws to allow for 
remote attendance. Um, also, you may remember we specifically, uh, Water Board specifically asked that, it, that remote attendance would be for Water Board members you know, on an occasional basis when they're either out of town, you know, ill, or, or for some other reason, they're not able to uh, attend in person. Um, so we discussed last um, month that we would change the section two. So if you if you go to page seventy eight of your packet, um, that is your by current bylaws with the red interlineation is what um, we talked about last month. We hopefully um, got that correct. Um, there is one revision to this language that I would propose, and that is, um, uh, it would say, tenants at water board meetings shall be in person except during emergency situations as allowed by the City of Longmont's electronic participation policy uh, during City of Longmont board and commission meetings. And then I would uh, ask that we add comma as amended from time to time, this actual uh, electronic attendance policy will go to council. In fact, I believe it's going to council later this month. And then um, uh, if they make revisions to it, what we've tried to do is, that way we don't have to amend the bylaws every time it changes. Um, so then the remainder is that um, water board members expect to attend in person um, and uh, unless out of town for health reasons. And then the other change to the bylaws that was proposed Oh yeah, just referencing, just referencing electronic policy. So I think it, it encapsulated it in section two. So okay. If that uh, if that meets water board's uh, intention last month, I think we can vote on it, and then all board members um, and Alice will be able to vote today. <laughs> right. right. So I think Allison has her hand up. Did you want to? Well, did you want to say something, Allison? Uh, I have one point of clarification, if I may. Um, as you guys may or may not know, my reason for not being able to be personally in attendance is my son um, is ill. So um, I was wondering if this proposed language would allow for absenteeism on such basis that it, it's not my personal health, but um, it is health reasons. So that is. Um, something I'd like to clarify. Well, the way I read what Ken proposed in you know, the last part of that statement, or unable to attend due to health reasons, um, that could be construed as to not your personal health, but health reasons within the family, I would think. So it's wonderfully ambiguous. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Scott. I, I think what is written there, Allison, kind of takes care of your concerns. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate that perspective, and thank you. Okay. Uh, any other comments? Scott, you've had yours, but you can comment again if you want. Sorry, no, I actually think it's written to cover what Allison suggests. I think it's ambiguous enough that it provides some latitude. If we wanted to specify every potential permutation of why you could miss or participate in that, that would be, that, that would, would not be a good exercise. I was only going to suggest that we've got the bylaws of the water board here. We'll need to change that date from January 25th, 2021, when we determine that we amend those to reflect the new date. That's my sole comment. I know, right? Uh, yeah, I'm good. Uh, I, I would also say that, I mean, if we had to specify health reasons, then we'd have to maybe specify why people are out of town, and that's just not a good exercise. So I, I think this is straight the way it is. All right. Uh, I'm all right with it, too. Is there a motion to approve the change in language? Yes. yes, Mr. Chair, with uh, the amendment suggested by Mr. Houston, I'd move to approve uh, Section 2's bylaw modification as drafted. And I will second that. Okay. Second. second. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Pass. So, all right. Alex, welcome.
<laughs> okay. Um, now, I would assume we'll just move on to item 7A, Nova Apartments Final Plat, action required. Um, and do you have any comments on that particular activity? Yeah, I think Russ will present that to you. Yeah, so um, included in the board's packet is some information on Nova Apartments Final Plat. It's a 10.28 acre parcel located north and south of, I'm sorry, of Nelson Road and Nelson Holder Street. All the historic water rights, including 18 shares of South Flat Ditch Company, were transferred at time of annexation. Um, consequently, the total remaining raw water deficit for Nova Apartments final flat is uh, 3.434 acre feet or 0.334 of an acre foot per acre of land. So Nova Apartments final flat will be in compliance with the raw water requirement policy upon satisfaction of that uh, raw water deficit. Additionally, I was just going to comment and, and uh, let the board know that this particular final plat includes um, five 52 unit um, apartment complex. So um, about uh, 250 to 260 uh, residential areas is what's a part of this. Um, and then, yeah, if we, uh, Heather, if you could jump to the next slide, just show the map where that's kind of located. It's, um, Located uh, behind, kind of behind Home Depot, and to the west is the general orientation of this, this proposal. Is all apartments? Yes. Yeah, in, in five in five buildings. Okay. Comments or questions? Just because it relates a bit to what we're talking about today, do we have any ideas how they're going to satisfy that deficit? So what we've typically found on a deficit of this size, which is relatively small, the developer will typically pay cash and moving water rights received to satisfy that deficit. And that's what I would expect here. Other questions? A motion to approve. Mr. Chair, I move to approve um, the. I'm not sure the, uh, the language is here, Wes. Uh, to forward a recommendation uh, to City Council to accept this. Uh, Thank you. I'll use your language in lieu of mine. Uh, I'll make that motion I was looking for on the agenda. I didn't see that. So. Thank you. Second? Yeah, I'll second. Right, so. Move second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right. And just to note, Allison voted uh, in favor of as well. Yeah, hand signal. Yes. Oh, is she, uh, can we hear her? Yeah, she just didn't have her microphone in here. All right. All right. Thank you. None needed on 7B. Um, now, Ken, as far as we're ready to take on 8B, right? Yes. Okay, so I guess Nelson can handle it. Yeah, I guess I, I will. Um, I was not at uh, your October meeting. However, Ken and uh, Wes updated me on your uh, discussion. And so, um, what we did was included your two amendments. Um, one was on uh, number nine, and I, I just wanted to, from a personal perspective, I've been wanting to change the bullet to numbers for a while, so I appreciate you guys changing that. <laughs> that helps a lot when we're referencing back and forth. So um, on nine, we instead of solely we put um, preliminary leave. And then we added uh, 22, which uh, addresses for stewardship efforts. So um, that's all outlined in, in red. And so that's basically all the really comments I have on it. So we looked at, uh, took your comments and put them in here. And, and what will happen um, with this, once you guys have a recommendation, 
I'll send it over to Sandy Sear, and then she puts it to, to, to together to city council in December, along with the other water principles, not just, I mean, city principles, not just water principles. Okay, all right. Okay, any comments on these changes? Allison, I think you were involved in the item nine, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, would, um, Heather, could you potentially move that up to? Sure. Yeah. We're good there. And looking at the minutes, um, sorry, I'm scrolling back and forth here. Um, my recollection is that the primarily was including. Am I looking at something different? I that that is right. The recommendation I I think was including. Yeah. I think there was some discussion about whether or not that made for proper, I don't know, uh, grammar or something, I suppose. But. I think to the extent grammar is a, a consideration, eliminating by could potentially rectify that. Um, in my opinion, the word primarily is, has a different uh, denotation than including. You want to call it including by those benefits without by, so be including those, including those benefits. Yeah. Is that correct, Alison? That is correct. Okay, we'll, we'll add that to that. You're already on, Allison. I did, thank you. All right, so, um, any other comments on? The revisions that are proposed. Okay, if not, I'll look for a motion to approve them. Uh, I uh, motion to approve the 2022 legislative guiding principles, water principles, uh, as amended uh, in the previous discussion. I'd second that motion. Thank you. We're moving second, all in favor? Second by we're saying aye. 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 Did you say aye, Allison? Oh, I did. Aye. You want to raise your hand or say aye? I think she said aye, but it was silent. Oh, all right. All right. <laughs> all right. There's a little bit of time left. All in favor? Okay, that's, that's passed, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, sir. All right. Okay, we've got item 66 HC, application for new water rights, appropriation, staff last board, water board for recommendation, city council concerning the staff application for new water right on St. Rain Creek. So, thank you, Chair. Um, just briefly, kind of to get us. Understanding why we're doing, we're proposing this application. Um, the water court, when, whenever you file for a new uh, water right, it's required that you, you know you do an overt act of appropriation. In the past, I usually meant out going out and sticking a sign on the creek and it says, "Hey, I'm going to file here. Or I'm going to dig a ditch here." Um, <laughs> More recently, with, with the increase of municipalities filing water rights, the courts have held that um, staff members, I, I can't go out and pound a sign in the ground, but staff members don't have authority to, to pro file for a new water right. Um, uh, actually, in the past, we did for many years, but the courts have held that the governing board, in the case of Longmont, the city council, has to pass um, an over that, which in, in our case would be a resolution. And so we will be going to the December water or December city council meeting 
to apply for a new water right, and we will need a resolution. And so, um, and obviously, what, uh, council will want water board's recommendation on this type of a, of a resolution and an action. Um, so that's that's what we're we're asking water board to make that recommendation. The actual water right filing itself is certainly different than than many you you've seen in the past. This one, this particular water right is downstream of Longmont, and we will be using it to meet downstream obligations. Um, it, it, it's kind of ironic that, that actually one of the hardest things we have to do is to be able to meet all of our downstream obligations. Um, you would think it would be getting water to the water treatment plant, which we work very diligently at, but um, we also have the downstream obligations. And those downstream obligations, um, first and foremost, is every time we change a water right, put it in the water treatment plant. We have to meet the historical return flows, ditch losses, those types of things that occurred um, from the historical use of the water, usually from irrigation. And so that becomes what we call a return flow obligation that we every year um, have to meet that return flow obligation. Secondly is um, things like the public service company exchange agreement. You know, we, we thousands of acre feet. We need to get down to them, uh, and, and uh, in exchange, we get CBP water into our water treatment, plant, which is very good. But we have that delivery obligation to them, and then we also have a number of leases and exchanges, um, and increasingly, we're getting um, augmentation requirements from uh, spent gravel pits. We have a number of augmentation requirements out at Sandstone Ranch um, from some of the work that went on, mining that went on out there. In addition, um, you know, we, there's a proposal, a, a mine that will open up fairly soon on the Golden Farms property just east of town, and, and that will have some obligations. Now, all of those projects bring their own water rights in, but one of the things that unique about um, those water rights is given that they're irrigation water rights they yield in the summer but they don't yield in the winter so we have um, delayed return flow obligations to the river that we need to um, meet during the winter time period much smaller um, than in the summer but it, it still occurs including for the actual irrigation what rights we go in the water court we change them then we use them but then their return flows, the further away from the stream they are, the longer the return flows took to get to the stream, usually it's about a year where you extinguish the, the return flow obligation. So there, there, those, so in, in short, there's a lot, a lot of um, downstream water uh, that we need to get into the stream as well, uh, including just simple leases that we do. We, over the years, have done a, a number of leases to downstream water users, and so we have an obligation once we sign that lease to meet that lease. Um, and then, in our latest case, um, the, it's the bonus ditch change case, which we just filed um, about a year and a half ago, a couple years ago. Um, we had one objector, the City of Aurora. Uh, which uh, uh, very vehemently um, wanted to make sure that our return flow obligations continued on into the future. Um, typically, what you, we've done for you know for well, forever <laughs> um, is that when you file for water rights, you not only file to um, change the water right. Uh, and agree to meet the, the, the return flow obligations, but you, you file and, and say as soon as, now that we file, on this date, any, any return flows that historically hit the river that are junior to this date, we won't have to meet. The reason, the logic behind that is everybody that's on the river, if, if they have a senior date to when you file, so you're junior to everybody. 
But the difference is, in that case, in that case, you are you you don't have to meet that water delivery obligation in the future when a new water rights owner comes on and files. Um, the courts have now um, gone away from that, uh, and and uh, to be real honest, the city of Aurora got dinged real hard on that, and so they're going to come out and ding everybody else. Um, I personally have a real hard time with that because basically that kind of takes away what the theory of what we call prior appropriation. <laughs> Somebody in the future, 50 years from now, can file a water right, and and now we're junior to that water right 50 years from now. Um, I understand the concept behind it. I understand why the courts are doing that, um, partially because there are many times when the car comes off the main stand, uh, such as in January, if there's icing and it can't get into storage, then, then all of a sudden the call comes off the road. So what Longmont looked at this and said, you know, it just makes sense now for us to go today out on the river, file for a new water right that we can use in the future, rather than delivering water from our current water supply, we'll be able to have a new appropriation that will allow us to meet all those delivery requirements in the future, um, whatever they are. So just real briefly, what, what our, our concept is, um, this, this is the main stem, left-hand creek coming in, wastewater plant, main street right here, um, Martin street right here. Um, <coughs> The primary point or the primary part of the filing will be right here, just downstream of Main Street, um, where if that water's in the creek, we'll, we'll be able to um, either take an in-stream credit or pull it out, run it through an odd station, put it back in. Hopefully we take in-stream credit. We haven't, uh, and I shouldn't say, I apologize for saying in-stream credit, bypass flow credit. <laughs> Where, where we're taking credit for the stream, uh, the water in the stream um, at that point. But we do have, we picked this point because we have the capacity in an existing infrastructure. There's a pump station that pumps water from here up to the bonus ditch. And there's a sand out channel in that that we can put a uh, gauge on it. And so we can physically pull the water out of the stream, run it down the, the sand out channel through a measuring device and put back in the stream. That's generally what the what the uh, holders or the usually the state is the one that's really hard and heavy on that, asking for that. Um, we're hoping to have, negotiate with the state so we don't have to pull the water out of the stream and put it right back in. Um, we're hoping to negotiate because there's a fish passage there that will dry up <laughs> if they make us do that. So ironically, one part of the state will say, don't dry up the fish passage, and others say, dry up the fish passage and measure it. So, um, irrespective, we have the capacity to, to measure that water there. The, sec the second part of the plan is to either at the St. Brain Creek pump station number one, which is there and existing, we would pull the water out there, pump it up to Union Reservoir, and then at a later date, be able to release it out of Union Reservoir. That requires Union Reservoir either to be full or expanded for the future uh, enlargement of the reservoir. Uh, one other point is um, some of the water that might be in Left Hand Creek or, or St. Green Creek pumped with the pump could come in here into the bonus ditch and we would put an augmentation station here on the bonus ditch and return it to the stream that way. Part of that is because um, earlier we just talked about um, some of the augmentation water this is the Golden Farms property. It's open space owned by the city. But when we purchased that property, um, there was an existing gravel mining operation already permitted. Um, and that's actually going to kick off very soon here. Uh, and we'll want to be able to run water through that when it's all done uh, for reclamation efforts. Um, and then another point we have is on Dry Creek at um, the existing augmentation station for the St. Sandstone Ranch Reclamation Project. Um, we'll be able to measure it, return it back into the stream at that point. And then finally, um, out 
east of town that's not built yet, but St. Rain Creek Pump Station number two, we would again be able to pump it there up to Union Reservoir, store it for later release. Um, and that part of that, part of the Union Reservoir picture is that it's, it, it's very limited times this will actually be in priority because of downstream. So you'll want to be able to pull water when you can and then use it later in the winter time periods uh, when, when you need it. You know, we have, we'll have a lot of downstream augmentation water available to us in the summer from both the uh, bonus ditch change cases as well as the uh, same grain integrated reclamation plant project at Sandstone Ranch. Those, those two irrigation rights are available in the summer, but we, they, they don't, are not available in winter when we have to meet those, um, as well as it allows us to kind of peak out. So that's, that's really the, the crux behind this application. It allows us to uh, draw a line in the sand today <laughs> uh, and, and have water for that downstream demand that we would like to be able to meet. Um, so I'll be happy to answer any questions about it and where, where we're, we're going with it, but um, if not, I'd entertain a, a recommendation. The one thing I would ask that, when, that the board specifically make the recommendation for application, uh, I, we've also attached a draft application so that the motion of the council would be in substantially the form presented to you. Because um, honestly, this is a draft application with a few tweaks we still need to do uh, to get that ready for water court. But um, timing, our, our desire is to be able to get this filed so we have a 2021 water uh, year appropriation. Uh, but, so we would like to file it by the end of December. So if we can get it approved today, we'll take it to city council for a resolution in December and still be able to uh, hit the water court um, this year. But otherwise we get next year's. <laughs> Questions for Ken Tom? So, uh, well, just first of all, how, how often do you anticipate being able to remove water under this particular, right? Or, or be able to use this water right, essentially? I, I would say, Possibly yearly because there's um, many times in spring the call will come, not every year, but some many years in spring it'll come off. Um, and many times in January it'll come off because that's uh, when they ice up on the lower river and they can't get water. It's really Riverside, Jackson, uh, Jumbo, and Jolivo Reservoir. Yeah, they, and, they uh, can't take anyway. They, they, they can't take it because it's icing up out there. Yeah. Um, that, that happened just this last year. There was a, a period of time. But yeah, there will be entire years. It's a very, very junior, really junior water run. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Brand new. Yeah, so, um, and then uh, under those years, when we can't do this, then it's just back to status quo, fulfilling those obliga obligations yep. with yep. Every, every other thing that we can do in the system. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Chair Allison has a question. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you touched on my question, Ken, regarding the um, uh, impact of diversions at these locations. The um, It looks like there's a number of different points of diversion, as you pointed out, at least two of them on the natural stream. 40 CFS is a fairly robust amount. And I was just kind of wondering what the base flow was um, in winter when this was intended to be operated and if it would be um, sweeping the river and it sounds like it that would have that potential. It's, it, it, is, pos it is possible. Um, generally, we're in the 30 to 50 CFS range uh, in the winter time period. So um, it, it is it, at 40, it, it would be possible, yeah. 40 is really the comes about because we have 20 CFS capacity on both of the St. Grand Creek pump stations. So if less than likely we'll use the full 40 um, at the, and it's only 20 at, 
It's 20 CFS at Sanford Creek pump station number one. So if we pull that one, if we pull into the two pump stations, the Sanford Creek pump station number two is below the confluence with Boulder Creek. So it has considerably more water down there than it does up, up at uh, uh, Martin Street on the, on the main stream. But yeah, there, there's times it will be, um, might not even be quite 40 there, but most of the time it's, I would say it's probably closer to 50, 30, 30 to 50. As a follow-up question to that, I'm trying to imagine 10 CFS in those locations, I would imagine that would just completely ice over. And if so, is anchor ice a consideration or concern? Um, you know, that certainly happens uh, further west. Um, it really happens up around the Button Rock area, except immediately below Ralph Price Reservoir. Um, but we haven't, I haven't seen it as big a problem uh, down here in town. But I haven't honestly operated the St. Green Creek Pump Station number two in winter. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it's not entirely impossible we have the same problem. That's why we would like to be able to, another reason we would want to be able to operate it as a bypass flow rather than be required to divert it. Because as a bypass flow, we can measure it. Um, we haven't really had a problem. The, the, the measurement station that's there right now, the St. Brain Creek uh, gauging station below Ken Pratt Boulevard, just to the west, east of where Ken Pratt Boulevard crosses the St. Brain Creek. And that gauging station has been able to operate uh, pretty much year round. We really haven't had a problem with icing over of that particular. Of course, that's below the wastewater treatment plant. So slightly warmer water um, hitting that than up above uh, below Martin Street. But um, still, we've been able to operate that gating station. And that's where we would measure it if we're allowed to do it as a uh, bypass flow. Um, just by taking out the flow contribution of the wastewater treatment plant. So that, that'll be part of our negotiations with, if, if there are any objectors and with the state of Colorado. Does that answer your questions, Allison? It does, thank you. Right. Any other questions? No. Can I just ask one uh, periodically, maybe monthly, uh, for a while here? I might need some vocabulary uh, assistance, right, with my new position. So I still say new because I, I'm, I'm going to keep that for a while. Um, so, uh, augmentation station is that just a gravel pit that we put water into and can move water out of later, or what, what are we talking about there? Uh, an augmentation station is is generally it, it's a structure where stream flows or, or water deliveries yeah. can can be physically measured. Uh -huh. So most augmentation stations consist of many of them consist of pulling water out at the head gate of an irrigation ditch, yeah. and then almost immediately, even sometimes upstream of the before you go into the ditch, they just build a Flume, where you either put a partial flume yeah. or a Rubicon gate or some sure. some type of measuring structure, that you can measure the water and it goes back into the stream. Okay, so it's okay. So it's just a measuring. Mm -hmm. okay. Other questions? No. Okay. Uh, keep your eye on Allison. But so, <laughs> given that, thanks for the information, Kim. Um, is there a motion to approve the application for new water rights? I would make a motion to approve the application for water rights as in substantially the form presented here in the um, in the application or in the in the packet for packet with the request that um, consideration of um, how to enable measurement uh, to take place in stream as opposed, or in channel rather, 
as opposed to requiring um, moving it out of channel be taken into consideration. Is that doable? Yes. Yeah, that's what we would like. <laughs> Absolutely. Anything else, Allison? No, thank you. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. All right. All right, then moved and seconded. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Thank you, Kim. Mr. Chair, for the record, it is absolutely in Ken's interest to ask for that. Unfortunately for Ken, it's in the opposer's interest to oppose it. So <laughs> we'll see who's more successful. <laughs> Anybody we know? Oh, no, hopefully not, but lots of people I know. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, that sounds like... Yes, it's, it's yeah. a good jousting competition. Yeah, yes. Just a comment. You probably don't have a finite answer, but how... Is this something you do on an annual basis or far less than that, or just out of curiosity? That we file a new one, right? Yeah. Um, well, a new one, very, very seldom. We do, we do change cases, a few change cases a year. But the last one was the recreational in-channel diversion in 2003 or so. Oh, okay. So it's right. once a decade or once every other decade. You get a, you get a, we all get a mark, a, yeah. get a mark for a new, new water right filing, which is very rare. Yeah. Yep. Right. Thank you. Okay. Item 8D, uh, Cowwood Fire Restoration Agreement. Is uh, Bryce going to handle this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good afternoon. For those of you who haven't met me before, my name is Bryce Hadley. I'm the senior watershed ranger up at Button Rock, uh, responsible for field operations up there, making water releases and looking after the property. Uh, included in your board packet is a service agreement between the city of Longmont and the Left Hand Watershed Center. This agreement would allow the city to participate in recovery efforts following the Calwood Fire. Um, as you're probably aware, the Calwood Fire burned over 10,000 acres, including uh, areas of the left hand and south St. Green watersheds that drain into Longmont and provide raw water to the city's water treatment plants. Um, after the Calwood Fire, the Left Hand Watershed Center helped found a stakeholder coalition that's known as the St. Green Forest Health uh, Partnership includes land management agencies, um, forestry authorities, um, and community organizations. Uh, and you'll see in your packet, a variety of different agencies that are contributing to the recovery funds. Um, Boulder County uh, contributed a little over a million. Um, City of Longmont in this service agreement is looking at contributing the, slightly over $134,000, which is the um, designed to be the same amount as the St. Green Left Hand Water Conservancy District. Um, so again, this, would, this service agreement would allow us to participate and contribute funds to these recovery efforts. Um, immediately following the fire, Boulder County took responsibility for field operations and pursued funding from the NRCS's Emergency Watershed Protection Funding Program, WP. Um, together, these efforts resulted in significant progress in protecting and recovering in the burned areas, but there's uh, there still remains work to be done, um, and substantial investment will be needed to maintain progress made by the coalition and expand recovery efforts to burned areas that haven't yet been treated. The attached contract shows the current recovery effort at approximately the $6.4 million level, with again, one must contribute contribution of $134,000. So we are looking for a recommendation from the board to the city council to authorize entry into the service agreement for fire recovery efforts in the Calipari area. So Boulder County and the city of Longmont, others involved, or are they the principal ones? In, in the coalition? Yeah. Um, so in terms of funding partners, that's laid out in the budget table, um, which is included in the packet. However, other stakeholders that are involved in the broader discussion includes uh, the U.S. Forest Service, um, as well as you know nonprofits including the Calvert Education Center, uh, all different kind of uh, authorities and stakeholders um, that contribute to the management protection of forest health. 
and water quality in the savory watershed. Question for Price? Okay, nice job, Frank. Uh, can I get a motion to approve the restoration agreement? I will move to uh, approve the Cowboy Fire Restoration Agreement as presented today. Mr. Chair, I would second that motion. Okay, move and second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, thanks, Frank. Okay, moving on to items 9A. Yeah. Okay, um, just a quick update on the Windy Gap um, firming project. And uh, well, at this point, they're, they're continuing to construct. I've got some pictures here we'll, we'll show you in a second of, of, uh, of the construction. So you may recall this is uh, a photo from last month um, where, where we were in uh, October 18th. And just to refresh your memory, this is, this is the main axis of the dam. If, if keep it, because uh, we go through the pictures, look at this um, uh, hillside here, this, this the, ax, the dam axis goes up here comes across and comes all the way up here. The second is, um, this is just one, this will be one month of photos. You can see the, the work on the core, on the key trench for the dam along here. Um, you also are just starting the, the road. There'll be a road that goes to the backside of the reservoir. You can see this is the pen stock. If you ever you know, drive up to Fort Collins, you look up at the hills. Whole hill, you can see that pen stop coming down, bright silver pen stop coming down. There will be a bridge over that pen stock, and that's actually under construction right now because to get a road around the reservoir, the road will go around the west side of the reservoir to the back side. There's a saddle dam on the back side, south side of the reservoir that's also under construction, and that road is under construction. Um, and that, and then also. Um, you can see the, the overburden that they're taking off the site. You can see they're starting to build uh, pads here uh, to store that overburden. And it's kind of interesting to watch the material coming over to here, the pads, um, watch the key trench going in, and then watch the activity up here. This is where the quarry is. And then watch the activity right through here. This is where a coffer dam is being built. Um, to protect the main dam as you build the main dam. So um, the next picture, so these are just one week apart. This is October 25th. Um, you can see some more of the overburden and uh, the copper dam going in. The next picture is November 1st, cloudy day. Um, but you can see the, the bridge going over the, the pen stop starting to come into fruition. You can really start to see more of the uh, work on the key trench as, as well as now there's four um, uh, stockpiles, overburden stockpiles as well. Some of the work starting to go up there on the abutment. And then the next picture um, is a week ago, you can see, really see the key trench there. And then the next picture is today. And you can really, really see the key trench right here. Um, and some more overburden taken up there where the coffer is. So that's kind of where construction is today. Um, always nice to get a, a picture, a fresh picture like that. Um, in terms of the uh, the work, the uh, the bridge over the pen stock, um, it's about a million dollars for that bridge, and it's uh, they've got the abutment formed for that now. Um, on the quarry, they've actually removed all the overburden off the quarry, and they've done their first pioneering blast. So they did one blast. Um, if I was better and quicker on the computer, I would have had it up there, but <laughs> I don't have a copy of that yet. Um, 
On the saddle dam, they've removed approximately 10,000 yards of overburden for the saddle dam, and that is going directly onto that road for construction of that road on the south side. It's actually a fairly involved road because if you saw those pictures, you got high enough into a lot of a lot of ridges that they're they're having to go through. Um, and so it's actually taking a little bit of work to get that built. Um, but that's the southern access road is about one third complete. So they're moving right along on that. In terms of the um, budget, um, they've drawn, um, so all the funding went into uh, an account um, that, that is, is drawn on. They've, they've drawn about 23 million to date. Um, they expect to draw eight million for the October payment and about 10 million for the November payment. So starting to spend some real money. Um, in fact, one of the bigger, one large expenditure was they just, the project just paid back 2.6 million to the Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District for purchase of red top ditch shares. Um, you may remember a number of years ago, um, Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District and the um, Windy Gap um, project purchased um, a bunch of shares in the Red Top Ditch, which actually diverts out of the Colorado River and irrigated land in what was um, going to be the Jasper Reservoir site, which was the original reservoir site from 1967 when the filing, the original filing was filed for the construction of the project. Uh, before it was decided it would be better to have the, the reservoir on the east side. Um, the red top dish shares are being changed. They, they actually um, will no longer irrigate and they'll be used for two, two things. One, to provide in-stream flow um, and augmentation of the Colorado River downstream of Windy Gap more importantly down in the 15 mile section for for Colorado River um, endangered fish recovery and um, as part of the negotiations for the uh, firming project um, uh, the original agreement with um, the West Slope with the Middle Park Water Conservancy District was they got the first 3,000 acre feet that pumped in any given year so in years that there was no pumping, it didn't come in priority, they got zero. In years when it pumped, they got 3,000. Um, kind of feast or famine, even more, <laughs> more so than the project. Uh, that didn't, doesn't work real great for them because they're, they need water you know, every year. Um, a lot of their augmentation programs, similar to here in the same brain where there's an augmentation program for our priority completions they need to, to meet that water every year. So um, part of the negotiation was to reduce that total amount, but make it um, every year. And of course the project couldn't guarantee that based on its water rights, even with the Fermi project, but was able to do it by taking the Red Top Ditch, which is very senior, and utilizing that water um, to meet that delivery obligation. So, um, that's kind of where the project is right now. Um, a uh, uh, companion project is the Colorado River uh, Connectivity Channel uh, going around the reservoir. Um, the 90% design drawings are now completed and under review by the NRCS. Um, it's expected to get their review comments um, before Thanksgiving is the, is the goal. Um, the permit, the permitting by the NRCS is still a critical path on that project. Um, and unfortunately, it's the economists <laughs> at the NRCS that are holding it up. So uh, th they have to do a cost benefit analysis. And they're, they're struggling with that. I think they can't figure out what the value of fish is. But, um, We'll get there, <laughs> um, but it will be open for public. We hope that it's open for public review in December. And so we're certainly let everybody know if that's going to come out to public review because we hope to get a lot of 
organization saying, hey, this connectivity channel is a good thing. <laughs> You know, it's a real good thing. It, it helps the environment, it helps fish passage, it helps uh, sediment transport, it, you know, uh, I, public public input will be great. I don't know, anybody would say it's a bad idea to do that. Um, and then if that uh, review comes to fruition and there isn't a lot of, the process with the federal review um, is that then the federal government has to respond to all the comments they receive during um, the public review process. Hopefully there isn't a lot, and, and they actually, NRCS is hoping to have a, a FONSI, or finding a no significant impact by the end of December. If that happens, we'll actually be able to catch this construction. They, they hope to start you know, late spring with some, some of the construction out there. It's, it's, um, it's not done, you know, again, when you look at the federal permitting process, you never know. So, that's uh, the status of the when you got funding budget. But yeah, thank you. Any thank questions? You. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, next item: water resources engineering projects update. Uh, Jason, you taking this? Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, uh, wanted to give you an update on two projects, both regarding the South Saint Rain pipeline. Um, the pump station uh, is still being manufactured, and right now it's still on time to be delivered in uh, February. We're currently working with purchasing contracts to get uh, an advertisement out, an invitation for bid to get a contractor on board uh, so that we can start uh, the preliminary uh, excavation and construction uh, starting in January. Um, so that'll be going out to advertising uh, here in the next week or two. Um, the other aspect of that uh, pipeline is the uh, rehab project. Um, I think last time I had spoken to you, I told you that uh, the liner was coming from Germany and was stuck in customs down in Texas. Uh, we passed through customs. We're now on a train heading to Colorado. So um, it should be here any day now. So it's very exciting. And uh, so we're working with the town of Lions to make sure that uh, once uh, once we have possession of that liner, that we can start uh, tearing up and. Uh, um, tearing up certain parts of the town and uh, putting in those temporary access points and get that liner installed as soon as we can. We'll be doing a lot of that work at night due to CDOT's Highway 7 project. We want to stay out of their way. And so we um, working with CDOT and the Town of Lions, we've decided to it'd be best for us to do our project at night. So that'll be one thing that's going on. But we're going to take extra measures to make sure that we try not to disrupt um, the, the adjacent residents as much as we can. So. Um, that's really all I have um, for those two projects. Or if there's any questions on those projects or any other questions, questions for Jason? I'm happy to answer those. Anybody? Thank you. Okay, water conservation update. Uh, Francie, an update for us? Yes, thank you. Um, I believe the budget passed since the last board meeting, so the additional half water conservation position is official for 2022. Um, so uh, I would look to Ken for when that hiring process will happen. Um, we are uh, finishing up the year. So uh, we finished our Resource Central contract and are planning for next year. I believe when I did my last update, there was a request uh, at the ask about whether we were going to increase our Resource Central Spill to Flow outdoor water audit. Um, we are doing that. We are going to increase that uh, next year since we did, um, I think we ran out of funding in mid-August um, to, to, to reach more households next year. Uh, we have seen a, an uptick in our Efficiency Works commercial program. That launched last year, so there hadn't been a lot of participation, but in the past, in quarter three, we started to see more businesses applying for toilet rebates and other indoor water um, programs. We still haven't seen multifamily participation, which is our greatest opportunity. Uh, but they, uh, the most likely reason is still COVID. Uh, our so equivalent on the energy side um, over in Longmont Power and Communications, they also haven't seen participation since COVID started with multifamily. So hopefully, as the pandemic continues to get better, we can see. Um, participation in multifamily buildings where we can hopefully do like 30 to 50 
toilets at once, which could have a lot of water conservation opportunities. Um, we um, are continuing right now one thing. So we, on our residential side, we have irrigation rebates. We have not yet developed that on the commercial side. We're doing some regional talks with Fort Collins, Northern Water, and uh, Loveland about non-irrigation, sorry, non-residential irrigation rebates um, and trying to do that in a regional approach that also works with landscaping companies um, because you can upgrade an irrigation system, um, but if it's not managed properly, you actually won't save water. So it's not as quick, easy as kind of, if you upgrade a toilet, no matter if people flush, it's going to save water no matter what, less so with irrigation systems. So we're, we're talking regionally about combining, um, kind of working with certification programs or looking into what that would look like before diving into non-residential irrigation rebates. Um, we also, uh, one opportunity, uh, this is connected to the AMR uh, grant that was received by the U.S. Uh, Bureau of Reclamation uh, last year. We are just starting to receive enough uh, data coming into our Neptune 360 program that we can start to look at leak notification of uh, continuous water usage. Uh, so we are, are just starting to talk with a number of staff of what that would look like for in our thinking of next year doing a uh, demonstration project. Uh, I are so that we can see how do we engage the customers when they have continuous water usage that is most likely a leak because that is a high opportunity for water savings that the new meters uh, and system allows us to do much more proactively because uh, we, after about, we could know, depending on how many days, but after two days or three days, we could know if there was high continuous water usage. Uh, we would know earlier, but we would want a couple of days to make sure someone didn't decide to like fill a pool in the summer. Uh, so that would allow us to hopefully help catch some <coughs> high uh, water leaks and save water. Um, so those are the, the main um, things that we're working on right now. Uh, lots of opportunities for next year. We're continuing, I believe earlier this year, I talked about the Growing Water Smart effort. We're continuing to work across city departments to identify opportunities for how do we integrate land use and water use planning and are continuing to bring in more staff to have those conversations and look for opportunities both on our internal um, kind of our parks, as well as in the developer and redevelopments and developers. So looking for lots of different opportunities of how to continue that effort throughout the next year. Yeah. Question for Francis? I was just making a comment that we found one of your lakes when we were doing our landscaping uh, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. And several of those drops of water made into our basement. We couldn't calculate how much is it? <laughs> not been substantial. Yeah. The leak has been fixed. Other questions? Thanks, Brandon. I love old town. Okay. Let's move on to item, we'll call it 9D, cash and lose policy review. Um, as you got into your packet, Wes, you did a good job of putting this together. There's a lot of information. Let me just suggest something, unless you have a different. As we go through these by section by section, give us your comments, how much you want to read and what have you. And now I'd like to just stop and see if anybody's got any questions and then move on to the next session because there's a lot to digest here. Great. rather than waiting. So if you don't mind, we'll just take it piece by piece. Good suggestion, Councilman. Okay. So I'm gonna just go ahead and start there on page 11 of our, our packet, and I'm gonna start um, with the early history. We're gonna, as we go through this information, I'm gonna highlight kind of the major tenets. I'll, I'll capture just the highlights in the paragraph. Uh, some of these will have different staff members present some information to help, help explain what we've got going on. Um, the early history uh, really starts back in 1964 when we became a home rule city, when the, uh, the, the water board and city council set up the raw water requirement policy. Um, 
And so it, this has been in place uh, for 60, almost 60 years now, um, that there's a requirement of, of transferring 200 feet of water in the direct flow of one of the storage. And then it talks about how they can make up a deficit if there is one. So in 1988, it, it, um, the water board and uh, staff um, looked at the way that it was evaluating cash in lieu. And so there was a report done in that. Um, it was determined that the marginal incremental cost pricing method would provide a sound practical means to determine cash in lieu. And so it basically talked about that it would be based on the economic principle that annex property should be responsible for the cost of the latest or mixed increments of raw water capacity that they uh, cause to be purchased. And so uh, we're continuing to uh, evaluate cash in lieu in that way. Um, and then further in 1993, the city's raw water requirement policy was formally adopted by reference in the Lama Municipal Code. And then in 2004, it was codified um, uh, for a specific inclusion in the code. So since that time, it's been an actual part of the code. In 2013, um, the current methodology was looked at in review of the current cost of water conservation efforts, new water supply projects identified in the City of Longmont's Raw Water Master Plan, uh, current market value associated with the purchase of CBT, and then the current market value of non historic water rights. And so um, that's kind of the distant past or the, origin, or the early history of it. Um, is there any questions on the early history, Paul? Just, I, I guess somewhere in here, did we at one time through this period just base the cost on CBT by itself without the other? That would be, that would be correct. Okay. There was a period within our early history where we, we were putting emphasis on uh, the selling price of CBT. We were struggling with getting the basin water rights back then, uh, as far as the cost of what the basin water rights were, and it was a limited amount of basin water rights, so then that's what it was for CBT. And, and at the time, we were actually, we made some fairly significant CBT purchases. So at the time, it probably even made more sense. You know, when, when that's what you're buying, it you know, makes sense to have. Value it on what your what your requirement. John. Um, so th this is just something to keep in mind, like maybe for the rest of the discussion. I don't know that it needs to necessarily be answered here, but my so my question about this entire process really kind of like boils down to what essentially like what and I don't know, I, I was going to quote somewhere in here, but, but we keep talking about it as the next kind of incremental cost, right? So that word has like a, a timeline associated with it, right? I mean, it's, so, so it's like, okay, what's next? That's done, what's next, right? And so I'm always curious as to like, those transitions that have perhaps happened in the past, being able to kind of inform what happens in the future. So. Um, at what point do we say, okay, that project is done, what's next, right? And so the, the, because then the next thing is what we actually have to kind of like base our, our cash and lube on, right? So, so for example, to put a finer point on it, when do we decide that like Windy Gap firming project is kind of done because bonds are issued and, and so that cost is kind of like in place. And then we say, okay, the next project is this, and then that becomes what we base the cash and move on, right? So I don't know that that necessarily needs to be answered right now, but it's just like kind of the way in which I'm thinking through some of these issues. And I don't know if that, if from a historical context, whether any of that discussion has been had already, such that maybe that would inform the future as to what we do in the future. Yeah, we, we to be really honest, we, Stop using CBT at the request of City Council 
when it, it took off. Right, right. Right. You know, we, we went from seven or 8,000 an acre foot to 19,000 an acre foot within a year, you know, yeah. three to, you know almost a threefold increase. And, and, and we had affirmatively made the decision in our raw water master planning efforts approved by city council that we would not focus on acquiring more CDP. So both of those things happened at about the same time. And that's when we said, no, we'll go back up and look at um, projects, you know, and, and what what will we spend the money on? Um, and that's when we went down from it. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a really good answer. And, and I'll, I'll punch on actually answering sure. when you get out. <laughs> Yes, yeah. because I think it would be good to have that conversation Absolutely. as between staff and board as we go forward. Um, other, other than to say, um, I sort of we sort of look on setting this price based on uh, it really does become policy, and whether I think it's still reasonable to use Windy Gap Hermy Project. At least partially, if not partially, even though it's being paid for, it, you know, it was bonded, but we will pay those bonds off over time, yeah. over thirty years, I think. Yeah, right, um, so it's it's not like even though it, it's built and quote, bonded, you know, you still have some 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 money there. Absolutely. But also, um, it it is a very reasonable, you know. We're really trying to find what's a reasonable metric to use to set, you know, and that seems like a reasonable metric. All the others we've listed here are reasonable as well. And I would say, even if we wanted to use uh, maybe way some CBT in there, it's still it's reasonable to do that, which is why, you know, one, well, we'll get into later, but there are a number of different ways of, of, of setting it, and I think. All of them are reasonable, but, but yes, um, uh, I do agree that we should have that conversation of yeah. you know, what is the next increment and when does it start? I agree. In particular, Thank when you. does it start? That's, yeah. that's what I'm, I agree with that. Okay. Any other comments or questions on uh, the early history? Okay. 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 Um, then I'm just going to, I would like to briefly touch on more of the recent history. So, um, so this would be from about 2013 uh, to date. Um, so since and following um, kind of council direction in 2013, uh, more specific emphasis has been placed on the unit cost of Windy Gap Fermi project. Um, Ken kind of explained a little bit on that. Um, a significant amount of the near term future cash and loot funds uh, they also go, or to, go towards payment of the bonds that were issued for construction of this capital facility that will su serve uh, the new uh, newly proposed developments. And so kind of going along with what you were talking about, Tom, um, um, we were realizing that was where this cash and money monies were going to go. So therefore, that, was, that seemed like a good benchmark to be looking at. Um, and further, in, uh, earlier this year in July, Council uh, directed us and board to further evaluate the current methodology and for establishing this fee and provide some analysis on the possible impacts if the fees were raised. So that's kind of kind of where we're at in the recent history. And just a comment now. Council's direction to further evaluate. Was there a thought in Council's mind that maybe what we were using needed to be tweaked or or how did that happen so it'd be you know it's it'd be great if marcia was here she could kind of help uh elaborate on what the what we have in front of you is what was taken from the kind of from the action minutes of the city council and uh and um so it was left pretty broad i think um i think they were just looking for us and board to look at how are we setting it and and um if that's still appropriate if the way we're still looking at it is appropriate or some changes need to be made but i don't know that we 
we weren't given specific I didn't, I didn't feel we had specific um, um, recommendation of what we should be doing we looked at kind of broad sort of like our policy so I, I will say that I mean I watched the that segment of the July uh, board meeting there was a motion on or an amendment on the table essentially to uh, to utilize I remember the number, but I don't remember the, the rationale. But the twenty-one thousand mm -hmm. amount. So that's the union station or the union reservoir pump rack, right? Mm -hmm. So you utilize a different metric rather mm -hmm. than the metric that 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 water board had had set. Mm -hmm. um, and so there there was enough of a kind of a, and it had been second, and they were about to vote. It seemed like, and then there was a, a lot of discussion ensuing about the implications and the ramifications of that choice and that decision including things like whether or not that would impact local agriculture because now people are going out on third developers are going out of the market to, to purchase uh, water from from them instead of just paying us to, to do the when you got permit for example so um so i think it was enough that there was a little bit of a some other ideas there from from council Basically, another way of saying is there a better way. I don't know if that's oversimplification, but I think they were just looking for a way to set the metric at a different value that would that was higher and have a rationale okay. for it, yeah. right? Yeah, specifically, we had attached the water board to communication, as you know from your quarterly meetings. The water board communication has a lot a lot of data in there and part of that data was um, union pullback union enlargement and uh, button rock enlargement and so those were in the low 20 thousand range and that's that's what council off the top was was saying well let's just use those criteria and uh, and then at that point, that says, no, we really want water board <laughs> to review this. Um, okay. they, they were a little uncomfortable taking their own decision, you know. Uh, and so that's really why they're asking the water board. To, you know, they just felt using the windy gap only um, brought down a little lower than they were comfortable. Okay. Yeah. Right. We would like, we'd like this to add additional. All right, this next session, uh, section, Business Services Division. Becky, you are going to give us some insight on that? I am. <laughs> I'm Becky Doyle, Director of Consolidated Services, and I think Heather is pulling up some slides. We're just going to go over um, kind of generally the, the financial structure of the water utility. Uh, it's been a little while since we've done one of these, so it seems like a good opportunity to review all the funding and um, expenditures uh, for the water utility. The next slide, Heather. So there are four funds that make up the water utility. Um, we'll start from the right side, which is the most restrictive. So we have the raw water storage fund, which the revenue source for that was the sale of high mountain dams in the long, long ago. And the permissible use of that fund was only for storage projects. So we have now fully expended that fund and we will close that down. So this will never appear on one of these slides again. Um, so that would, yeah, right. So that went into, um, you know, that was part of our, our payment to Northern Water for the construction of, uh, of Jim's Hall Reservoir. So then Water Cash Acquisition Fund, uh, the revenue source for that is cash in lieu of water rights. And the uh, allowable expenditures are for water supply, so new water rights, uh, uh, water conservation, uh, you know, expansion of supply. So pretty restrictive. Yes, question? No, sorry, you can finish up and I'll ask a question then. Oh, okay. <laughs> so then the water construction fund. Oh, and I, I'm, I'm just, I'm sorry, is there a balance, a, a, a known balance at this point in cash and lieu um, funds that have been brought in and not yet expended? I don't recall what the balance in the fund is. We, we very much expend most of most of the balance in uh, in water cash acquisition fund which is also for for Jimmy Hollow. There could be you know, fancy maybe no more than a million, but yeah, just, just the curious. Only, the only amount I think that recently came in this year um, in twenty twenty one, we've 
it was a particular development in the last that. couple <laughs> months that uh, brought in about $940,000. So I think that's still yet to be uh, expended. But yeah. all the cash in prior to that, I think it's pretty much been. Is it historically an in and out fund? You cash in and then cash goes out almost immediately. Well, it's not something that you're. No, we, we do tend to. I different lines that do it different ways. I'm just curious. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we do tend to build up balances. So, you know, we, we expended probably close to $7 million in total for the Winnie Gap firming project. Yeah. And we had been not making many other expenditures um, up until then. I think we've made some smaller purchases of water rights over the last, you know, five to 10 years, but, but nothing large. Um, so, and now the. Moving forward, uh, potential expenditures include, you know, making part of the bond payments related to the gap or, um, you know, other supply projects as, as appropriate. So, okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so then the Water Construction Fund is funded by system development fees. So these are fees paid at the time of building permits. Um, and the allowable expenditures for that fund are costs to expand the system. So um, the, primarily, the, you can also spend it on meeting new regulatory requirements, but for the most part, it's adding capacity um, to, to serve new development. Um, on an annual basis, you know, that, that can range between about you know, three to five million dollars right now. We expect that funding source to diminish over time as we approach um, you know, our, the, our planning horizon where our population expands less. <laughs> um, and then finally, our water operating fund is our most flexible fund. So that's uh, primarily where, where rates go in to fund things as well as, you know, miscellaneous revenues associated with things like, uh, you know, button rock permits and <laughs> everything else that doesn't fit into a different bucket and same on the cost side. So anything that is, uh, you know, related to the operation of the water utility is an allowable expenditure in the water operating fund. Um, so that's how the funds break down. Any further questions on funds themselves? Yeah, just a quick question. Then, uh, since Ash and Moon is a subject at hand, uh -huh. um, that does not impact rates directly or not directly it, yeah that's exactly right so so whatever we raise in cash and new of like and, and part of the reason that i went from right to left there it's like most restrictive the least restrictive whatever we can pay with those restricted funds is something we don't have to pay out of rates so it's really an avoided cost more than it is a direct impact to the rate if that makes sense okay okay <laughs> so that was slightly roundabout but no that's all right yeah so um, just trying to, I'm really trying to work my way through this. So, um, so the, the, there was a statement at the water, at, at the city council meeting where it said impact fees cannot be used to adjust rate. Is that, did I capture that correctly? So, so in other words, like our cash in lieu and, and the rate structure, are they all intertwined? So in other words, can we get, if we fix the cash in lieu at a different price, could that somehow be used to make sure that water rates, residential water rates, either the fees don't go up or the, not the fees, the, the, the rates don't go up in the future, or that we could somehow diminish them or something? So not directly, but yes, indirectly. So. Um, if, if we collect cash in lieu um, and then use that to make, for example, the bond payments uh, related to the Windy Gap Firming Project, then that's an expense that we don't have to pay from rates. However, we don't, we don't project um, revenue from cash in lieu because it's, it's all dependent on, on the development cycle. So when we set rates, um, it, it assumes no revenue from cash in lieu. So it, it only affects the rates for sort of the next time that we set them, uh, you know, whatever costs we were able to offset through what we collected um, as you know, development occurred. Uh, it's such a tricky one because if I'm a member of the public, right? And yeah. I say, well, I want developers to be charged more via cash in lieu 
so that my water rates don't go up? Mm -hmm. If the answer to that is, well, those two funds are disconnected, so therefore uh, they're not related, and so we're talking about apples and oranges here. That's an easy thing to, to say. That's not what we're saying, though. Correct. It, it, it's, it is, they're kind of intertwined, but not in a predictable way, and so therefore we don't know whether cash and loot in any given year would affect the rate structure, but perhaps it could, but we're not sure. Right. So, yeah, so exactly. in convoluted stories, that's the hardest to tell. Yeah, that's I know. a great message. So, <laughs> that's a really concise well, message. Yeah. Well, like, uh, yeah, but, uh, <laughs> so it's it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a teacher. Yeah. It's an important factor yeah. yes. to the public, I'll guarantee you. Yeah. So, anyway. All right, carry on, Becky. All right, so next up, um, we just want to talk about how how we set those rates and fees um, other than cash and money. <laughs> Next slide there. Okay, so so rate rate setting is a pretty straightforward process. There's a uh, you know an industry standard um, uh, methodology that we use, where we essentially we, we determine the revenue requirements. So what's the money that we need to operate the utility? Then we go through a cost of service allocation, where we, we take all that that money that we need to operate the utility and, and decide you know, which user classes. Um, to allocate those costs to. Um, and then once we know the cost of serving each user class, uh, then we design a rate to collect uh, the, the cost of service from, from each class. So, right, clear as mud. Um, <laughs> but, you know, a very, very clear um, uh, uh, method that we, that we use there. So then we have um, our system development fees. Sorry for equation. So, so for system development fees, as well for the wind gap, as, as for the wind gap surcharge, which is the next one here, we use a, a buy-in methodology. Um, it, in contrast to a, like an incremental method or, or you know marginal methodology, which is what um, uh, is is used in the cash and loop. So what we do with a buy-in method is we try to look at the value of the infrastructure that you know the community or the utility has has invested in to date. Um, and then figure out the value of that on a per connection basis so that as new connections are added, they're not diluting the, the value. Like everyone is, is contributing what, you know, what uh, this, the value of uh, what was already in place when they, when they got there, <laughs> so to speak. So what we do is we take the value of the existing infrastructure. Um, and so for the system development fee, that includes our treatment in infrastructure, our distribution, and, and then the raw water lines, like so that the uh, supply infrastructure, but, but not the water rights, um, and not the wind gap project. And we subtract from that um, bond principal outstanding, uh, because that's going to be part of what um, these new customers pay for in their rates as we move forward. And then we divide that by uh, the single family equivalent unit. So looking at all of the um, connections currently in the water system, you know, if, if those were all uh, single family residential taps, like how, how many would there be? So right now, um, for a single family residence, that, that works out to approximately $6,500 per connection. Uh, there's a component that's related to the domestic use and a component that's um, based on the square footage of the lot. So that can vary a bit. Question? Yeah, I was only thinking whether the single family equivalent units were those that were built at the time that you valued out, or those are the ones that have been platted and will, will be built at some point in the future. It is the ones that are built at the time. So yeah, so sort of that existing infrastructure piece. Then uh, for long run, that's around 30,000 30, mm -hmm. or so. Yeah. Then on the commercial side, that is calculated in a whole different process. Well, so it was strictly residential. No, no. So we 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 would convert and we would say, yeah, okay, a brewery uses about as much water as two houses or something okay. like that. So okay. based on the average use per class as well as the um, the the capacity of of the meter for that connection, we have a whole. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Yeah, so, so this covers. All users. Yeah, so we okay. convert everybody to what would what would it be like if you were single family equivalents? Okay. Mm -hmm. So same essential calculation for the windy gap surcharge. 
Uh, but what we've done there is we've taken the, the value of both the parent and the firming project or, or Longmont's contribution to the parent and the firming projects, um, subtracted the bond principal outstanding and divided by those same single family equivalent units. So we just reset this um, in, when was that? October, um, after we made the, the payment to, uh, to Northern. And so we'll, we'll revisit that periodically as that bond principal outstanding reduces. Um, and that's approximately 1520 per unit. So, and I, I don't know if there was anything in particular, but that was all I had on that. <laughs> I don't know if that's further questions about Becky's information. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Let's uh, move to topic front range water provider cash and lieu comparison. So unless you got some comments on that. Yeah, so Nelson's actually going to get some of the highlights on this particular one. So um, what I want to do is, so, so Ken kind of started this in, in late October, and they handed it off to me early last week. So these are the entities that we've actually been able to get a hold of. Um, and I, I don't want to go through each entity because everybody, I just want to make general comments. So when you look at this and you look at the different pricing, based on our conversations and our research that we've done. And a lot of the research has been um, also through their website as well. A lot of the websites for these entities will have information on it. So a lot of your higher fees will be entities that is mainly asking for CDT units. So that'll raise your, your higher, make it to your higher range. Now your lower range is usually entities that will ask for um, uh, their cash and will be based on like basin water rights or, or their own water storage projects. Or other entities will have it based on like um, their, their basin water rights plus regional projects like the Windy Gap Furby and then NIST, which is the Northern Integrated um, Project. So they'll base it on that. So they kind of, every entity, more we look, have different criteria and different reasoning behind their cash and lift. It is not the same as Longmont, and then one entity to the other entity is not the, it, it changes each one. So as I kept going through this, I kept saying, wow, I can't believe how, how, how it's set so much different. So everybody looks at it differently. And sometimes they'll be asking for cash and lube for, and we've talked about this in our discussions, they'll be saying, we, we want cash and lube only, and then a year or two later, they'll, they'll look at it and then they'll be asking for um, water rights only. So it really kind of goes back and forth per entity. So I kind of wanted to get that out there um, before we start, you know, kind of an overview of it. Because, you know, we did this kind of quickly. And, um, and a lot of this, a lot of them that I've seen, they do review. Some of them will do it like every few years. Some will do it, you know, more recent, like, every year and um or every six months can they kind of you know if that's also how they review it is differently from ours ours is quarterly so everybody does the review timing different they do their reasoning behind it different so it's hard to say we're at this we should go to this because they are because everybody has different reasoning behind it. that's my that's my point i hope i'm clear um that's my main point on this this sheet here that we're looking at and and for, for um, December, um, we'll continue to reach out to other entities or fine tune the information that we have on these entities. And when I do that, I'll correct the date on the top there. So um, we'll just keep keep doing that as we're progressing through for December as well. So is, is there any questions? Because I didn't want to go into and pull out like a Fort Collins and go through the detail. I guess I think that's not necessary because they're all different. You know, to uh Simplify this. This is, and this is very much a simplification. If you look at how, what they're doing, I mean, it, is the bottom line in these cases everybody's trying to look for the cost of water, basically. Is that, I mean, it's very simply said, said, but 
That's right. basically what the, we're all trying to do. Right. With yeah, uh, and that's a good point, Roger. That, uh, so when folks are looking at just CBT, the rate of that's going high, so that's why their cash flow is high. If they're not looking at other, other um, sources, yeah, other sources like their basin water rights or their own projects. Some of them have their own projects that they're involved with. Other their their own storage, and so they focus on that because that's kind of their priority. That's something that they see that they can be built um, sooner to help their supply. Okay. And a lot of this, a lot of the northern entities um, are in this. Well, quite a few of these that are up here are, are in this. They, they definitely are in, in that project. And, and northern's helping with this. I know Ken knows more about it than I do, but um, they definitely, a lot of them are part of that for their supply, so. Okay. And probably one of the differences between us and many of the water providers they have they have one fee as Becky just showed you we have the cash and loo and then we have a way to get surcharge mm -hmm. so there's they're different they, they, they're not the same thing <laughs> and so I caution not that don't you can't add them but you also can't forget that, that those two charges are there so really there's developers can come in they're going to pay a tap fee if they win to get surcharge fee, they're going to pay cash and do more water rights. So they're different in that the water rights are specifically bringing you up to 380 feet per acre, whereas when you get surcharges to cover an incremental cost of when you get, but, but it's still, it's still all, all there. We can. I might, I might say it differently on the weedy gap surcharge because the weedy gap surcharge is really to recover the cost of, of the, the infrastructure, like the, you know, the supply infrastructure, of the raw but not the right itself. Correct. And that's, I think, what is different between you know, that charge and then you know, what we may do with cash flow. Agreed. And so, Chairman, one other thing I want to add is that I, I did talk to a couple folks. Um, so, some of them were CBT only. And then they have the ability now with no with no basin water rights, they have their own basin water rights. Now they're having the ability to get involved with basin water rights. So then they stop asking for CBT only, and then they're trying to generate cash and move to help pay for those basin water rights. Where as Ken pointed out, a little bit different for for Longmont is we have a lot of basin water rights. And the basin water rights usually I wouldn't say always, but usually is a lot less than CBT. And so that's another reason behind mm -hmm. a lot of these other with the, with the lower rates. Yeah. yeah. Should we go on? Sure. Okay. So um, I'll just touch briefly on the next section. It's the evaluation of prior Woody Gap project allotment contract sales. So those are kind of the parent project. So um, since the parent project, <clears throat> that being Mini Gap, was um, uh, allocated. There was originally six cities, and Longmont was one of the six, and we had one sixth ownership in that. Um, so what we have here, that little further down there, is the um, table, which shows kind of what has happened in the last five years in terms of sale of those um, uh, units of the parent project. And I think that what I would note in here is you can see the progression of increased price, unit price as time went on. They were running around 15, uh, 1.5 million per unit back in 2017, then it went to 2000 and keep going up. And then uh, most recently in 2020, they were selling at a, a unit of about 2.7 million. And then you'll, you'll be noted in here that um, PRPA, they still have 10 units that they're planning to sell by bid in the next few months, and they're expected to set a minimum bid price of about $3 million per unit. That's what we set, and that's what's expected. So a continuing appreciation of value in those. So um, that's really all I have generically on the sale of that. If you have specific things, we can talk about obviously. So this, just to be clear, this is units of when you got firming units. Not, not firming, it's just part of the parent project. This, so, so, this is, okay. so this is really separate from when you got firming. This is 
there was a finite amount of Windy Gap parent units, yeah. uh, and uh, there was 480 units total. And we have a and the city of Longmont has 160 uh, or 80. I'm sorry, 80. Excuse me, 80 of those units, right. and then other other entities have the remaining uh, 400. So it's each unit represents, I think, is one roughly one forty-eight thousandths of a, an acre foot. Yeah. Hundred each unit is a hundred acre foot. One average. Hundred acre feet per unit. Right. So total forty-eight thousand. The point is, this is just for the parent project. The, this that we're talking about here is sale of the parent projects. You, you, in order to be part of the Windy Gap permitting project, you have to own the parent project. So when, so for example, when did Longmont, when did we, when did we buy into the parent project? This is initially from the very beginning. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so th this is okay. Yeah, so nineteen eighty. Nineteen eighty. Okay. So if I may, and this may be just speculative, right? Um, the parent project has existed, it has a track record, it has a yield that is somewhat reliable. And the firming project now is a bonded project that's being constructed. And is there any indication that people that are involved in that now feel that they have oversubscribed or have different uh, whole demand needs going to the future? And is there going to be a market for the firming project um, units as well, and if so, is that has that started yet? Mm -hmm. I know among the NIST participants, there's been a lot of talk about that, and they're waiting on the record of decision to <laughs> to have some certainty. So, if you guys have some certainty, and they're waiting to get firming, so yeah. So, um, Longmont sold. We were Longmont was originally in the project at sixteen thousand acre feet, yeah. and we. Um, we got down to 10,000 acre feet, and the costs were equally distributed. So we got our money back through cost and yeah. reallocation. Yeah. Once we hit 10,000 acre feet, Northern said we're done reallocating costs. If you want to get your money back, you got to sell it. So we sold uh, at cost. Previous, we went from 10,000 to 8,000. And then 8,000 to 7,500. And those two times we went down, um, we sold those units for our cost. Right. Um, at this point, no, there, there's, yeah, there's a great demand out there. Everybody it's would love to get sure. more firming project water, yeah. but there isn't anybody willing to sell any. Yeah. Um, probably will be some PRPA water as they start to go to renewable energy, mm -hmm. um, but how much we don't know. So how, how is that parent project? So I just want to get all my ducks in a row. So how is the Windy Gap parent project, right? Like, how is that distinguished from CBP water? Because I mean, it's all it all comes to Northern, presumably, or managed by Northern. So, so CBT is separate. Sure. So CBT was, that was the original. Yeah. Um, and we have certain amount of ownership of CBT. Yeah. And Winnie Gap in 1980 went in there and filed their water right that uses their system, but at the time didn't have any storage for that. And so they're, they're kind of like, a little bit like a brother and sister. Um, they come over through the same infrastructure. Right. Mm -hmm. So there was just more. There was there was additional uh, potential to use the infrastructure to move more water. Mm -hmm. And it and does it come over the Windy Gap project water? Does it come over and get stored in Carter and Horsetooth and all of those that part too or no? No, it it can it can pump into uh, Lake Granby, um, but it can only be stored in Lake Granby. Only stored in Lake Granby when there's excess water storage capacity. So some years Lake Granby doesn't fill, so you can put some water in there. But then next spring, if you haven't used it by that next spring, and Lake Granby fills, it spills the Windy Gap water. Okay. So that that's the real crux of why the firming project, because 
there is more water that you can pump. Um, ironically, the, 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 the Windy Gap project was actually the, the tail end of the CBT project. When the CBT was originally contemplated, they were going to pull water off the Fraser River, yeah. uh, bring it around and drop it into Granby. But that was too ex thought to be too expensive at the time. And so they didn't build that last segment of the project. So then later on in the 1960s, um, the six cities went together and built a pumping plant on the Fraser River to pump up to Lake Granby. And, they could, and so that's it. But they knew that was it wouldn't be sufficient. So they filed for a water storage vessel called Jasper Reservoir on the West Slope. And then when, um, when it came time to build that, um, looked at that, and of course, one of the things you have to do is look at all of the alternatives for a federal permit. Yeah. And there were 258 reservoir sites and went down, studied very extensively, and Chimney Hall won. <laughs> uh, one of the big issues was there were, there were some environmental issues on the Jasper Reservoir site. But one of the big issues was you wanted to get your water underneath the Continental Divide to this side of the divide in case of yes. the tunnel, in case, in case the tunnel capacity is being fully used by CBT, you can't get your water over because the tunnel's full, um, which it, which a lot of times of the year it's full. So yeah, that's that's what happened. So yeah, that that's how those two operate together. So it comes over, and but then it has to be immediately distributed it you can't you can't store it except for now we're building a reservoir yeah once we build the reservoir we'll build a storm field. right now what you do is you you can take what's considered immediate delivery so if Longmont wants some if we have windy gap sitting in Lake Trinity we can just pull it out of Carter or okay. Fort Collins to pull out of Horseshoe. So it's a but it has to be sitting over there. there and then they'll bring it over at a later date. Okay. My apologies, thank you. For Let me make a time. suggestion. It's 4.52. I don't want to rush through this because there's a lot of meat still left in this thing. Uh, I, I would suggest we stop at this point and pick it up next month. We're talking about cash and lieu anyway in our December sure. meeting. If, uh, but I, I, these discussions are pretty substantial. I want everybody to understand what's going on so we can come up with a decision a knowledgeable decision, so if there's no objection, uh, I'd like to stop. Mr. Yeah. Chair, I had to let Heather and Ken know, and Todd know that I had to leave at 4.45. I mean, it's going to wait till 5. That would help me tremendously because I don't want to miss the participation. And I'm going to get the full partner. To cut it short. So, but well, thank you. Be ready for more next month. Mm -hmm. and, and Nelson, you too. And, Thank everybody for coming to this guy. Can I ask one question just in case it's not available and it wasn't in here and it could be provided in December? Sure. The ability for anybody to bring in water to dedicate that is in basin water is somewhat limited by the amount of in basin water that's left available and not already brought in or not otherwise encumbered in some other fashion. Do we have a sense of how much native water is left that would? Could potentially be dedicated to Longmont under Longmont's current rules of what they accept and so forth. Because yes. I don't think I saw that in there, and I was just curious if there was knowledge and if that was something we could yeah. perhaps see. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be able to provide a general sense. We couldn't say exactly. Sure. But I think we could definitely give you that. Yeah. General sense of what that would look like. So you're balancing what you can bring in versus what you well, can bring in. What I'm hearing you ask is there's what, a finance how much supply. remaining non historic water would be eligible, likely to come to Longmont. I mean, there's, we think, some de minimis amount of additional land that can be annexed in, too. So there's, you know, so there's some metrics on there that, that factor into what yeah. we should expect people to be able to bring in versus bring in in a different fashion than our existing program. Yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, anything else on uh, item 10B? In that way, Ken? Uh, no. Eleven. Anything on one? Yeah, wait. Or twelve. Or zero.